All right, we're ready to start chapter 15. Or chapter 14, we look again at the 144,000. We mentioned how they were uh, sealed in, in chapter 14. They're now in heaven. In chapter 7, they were on the earth, redeemed, purchased by the blood of Christ. These are, uh, that's a symbolic number to represent those who truly belong to God. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's our sealing. It's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual issue. In the last part of 14, we looked at the harvest, uh, the, which is the time when God is going to bring uh, everything to a final end. And, uh, okay, here we go. Yep. i got to go way down the list again. To get I didn't know how far to go. Yeah, I'm clear down to 15. So. so we're talking about the harvest. Do you remember what scripture we talked about when Jesus was doing his teaching? It was in from Matthew. Remember the parable we looked at there? Everybody? Pardon me? With the sowing the seeds on the Yeah, the parable of the weeds. Yeah, this one here. They're gonna be gathering. Remember the, the angels are gonna be harvesters? And he's going to be treading. You've talked about the wine press. Um, the judgment that's going to come. Remember we talked about the wine being mixed and unmixed. That the wine mixed with spices means it's enhanced. When it's unmixed means it's not diluted with water, which many times wine was in that culture. So it's an intensive way of saying that this is going to be a, a final intense judgment from God for those who don't have the sealing from the Holy Spirit. Who those don't belong to God, don't belong to Christ. This is the faith. This is the judgment. Uh, it didn't sound very good, does it? To have the full cup of His wrath poured out and tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the angels and the Lamb. That's what verse 10 says there at the end of 14. And then those who receive the mark of His name. That's not physical, that's spiritual, it's who you belong to, it's your life, who, who have you committed your life to, and those who obey, notice verse 12 there, this calls for what? Patient endurance, alright, on the part of the saints who obey his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. He said that before, at the end of chapter 13. Well, what was Jesus' message to the churches? Be faithful. Be faithful. Be an overcomer. If you are an overcomer, there's promises that he gives you, right? And the warning was for many of them, five out of the seven, there were certain things they needed to be careful about. Um, blessed, there's a, there's a beatitude in verse 13. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. There's seven beatitudes in Revelation. I gave you a handout. I'm going to refer to one of those, uh, one of the handouts in a minute. And then we have the harvest picture. So chapter 15, we're coming to the uh, another part of the vision. And there we go. Let's look, let's look at what it says. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues. Now we've had a series of sevens, haven't we? The seals, the trumpets. We haven't got to the bowls, but they're coming. And this is kind of another way of saying, this is it. The others were kind of a recap of telling how God's going to work through history. They were partial. The trumpets were third, or the seals were third, trumpets were fourth. They're, they were partial, but this is going to be complete. Their last, look, look at the wording, their last, because with them God's wrath is what? Complete. Okay, this is he. He's bringing it all together here very soon. I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. Okay, we talked about the number of his name. Remember that? The Greek word therion. When you translate, translate that to Hebrew, what's the term we used when the Hebrew letters are used for numbers? Gematria. And when you translate Therion, the Greek, into the Hebrew, 
It comes out what number? 666. 666. That's the number, his name. It's a symbol, symbolic number talking about the beast. That are, this is what here notice what he said. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So when you read about the sea, we, we, he talks about having the vision of the sea. What's that bring to mind? Again. What's John pushing us back to? What what he meant? Crossing the Red Sea. This is the big event of Exodus is Israel coming out of Egypt. Bondage. Slavery. God delivering them. So there, beside the sea, what takes place? Well, they've got the sea in front of them and they got Pharaoh's army decided they shouldn't let them go in the first place. So they're charging after them. And they're stuck between Pharaoh's army and the sea. And they are real happy about that, aren't they? What's their reaction? Fear. Yeah. What are we going to do now? And Moses says, why don't you just be quiet? <laughs> just be quiet. Stand still and watch what God can do. And he raises the staff. The waters part. They walk over on dry land. Pharaoh's army is destroyed. Exodus 15 is a song of victory. Miriam, his sister, leads them in this great song of victory. That they're, that's the, the sea, and the sea represents what in Scripture? What? Evil. evil. It's a picture of chaos, evil. Um, the beast came out of the sea, Romans 13, or in Revelation 13. The, the armies of Rome would come out, of, they would come through the sea waters with their armies, and like a picture of them coming up out of the sea in the Mediterranean. So that's the imagery. But here it's got, first of all, kind of mixed with fire. It's like, we really want to, it's like the beast, the enemy wants to really keep causing trouble. It wants to raise its ugly head. Well, he does, doesn't he? In fact, Peter says he's like a what? He's like a, a lion who wants to keep seeking out prey. Now, he knows he's beaten, he's defeated, but he's not happy about it. And he wants to do all the damage he can do. So he works through different means. It's, it's that picture. But notice what else it says. They're standing beside the sea. Where, where do we find the sea? We find another image of the sea earlier in the book. And what is it pictured as? Gentle. It's like glass. It's calm. In God's presence, there's no threat of evil, is there? You remember the event on the Sea of Galilee when Jesus and the disciples are in the boat? This huge storm breaks out. And Jesus is just what? He's sleeping. <laughs> Hey, don't you care? We're going to die. <laughs> They've got the master in the boat. <laughs> and he just gets up and he, the word he uses there is rebuke. He rebukes. So the same word he uses to cast out demons. I think that was a, I think that was an effort of the devil to get rid of him. And all he does is just stand up and speak and everything is what? Just instantly calm. That's the picture here. Where are they? They are standing. They're standing there beside the sea, victorious. Imagery, John borrows, Red Sea event, Israel coming through that. That's the, he's constantly borrowing from the Old Testament pictures and imagery. And they're singing a song, a new song, uh, reference to Song of Moses. Where'd that come from? Miriam. That's one of the songs, but there's also a Song of Moses. That's recorded in Deuteronomy 32 before he died. And he records, in fact, it's Deuteronomy 32 that uh, I used in the seminar, you remember, the cosmic conflict? Talking about the angels and how God is going to redeem the nations. He's going to bring the nations back to himself. There's a verse there in Deuteronomy 32:17 which we used before, they sacrificed to demons that are not God. Israel was doing a lot of that. Gods they didn't know. Gods your fathers didn't fear. In verse 18 of Deuteronomy 32, he clearly says, you deserted the rock. Who's the rock? Jesus. Paul says the same thing in Corinthians 10, where he says this rock that had was with you in the wilderness, that's Jesus. Okay, very, very clear. You deserted him, he says there in Deuteronomy 32. 
You forgot the God who gave you birth. And then later in the song, in verse 43 of Deuteronomy 32, he, said, he talks about what's going to happen later. Rejoice nations with his people. He will avenge the blood of his servants. Well, that's what, that's what Revelation has been telling us. In Revelation 5, it was the cry of the martyrs. Lord, how long are we going to wait for justice? And here Moses is saying he will do it. He will take vengeance on his enemies and make atonement. And so we're here. We just talked about the harvest. And John's continuing the imagery with this picture. And then we get this, this song. This song of the Lamb. That says two things. And it's like, we've talked about this before, and, and Jason's mentioned this, it's chiasm in, 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 in the writing here. It's a technique of literature. So that's what, that's what this is in these next couple of verses. Great and marvelous are your deeds. That's one part of the chiasm. Look at the bottom part. For your righteous acts have been revealed. So you got that. And in between, you have really a, a message of who God is, and, and how, in verse 4 is the key. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? Why? Why will they fear him and bring glory to his name? Because of two things. Because of who he is and because of what he's done and is doing. So great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. None of these other gods... That, that you as Israelite bow down to in the wilderness, and that's what Deuteronomy 32 was reviewing. All nations will come and worship before you. What's that tell you? He's doing what he promised to Abraham in Genesis 12 when he said, Abraham, I'm calling you out of all this rebellious mess. You're going to be my servant, and from you, you're not only going to receive a blessing, but, but you're going to be... Uh, your seed is going to be like the sand of the sea. And all nations will come and have that blessing. That's in Genesis 12. God wants to, he wanted even then the promise of, of reclaiming the nation. That's what this, is ta this song is talking about. And aren't people coming to Christ from all over the world? Even as we sit here, they're coming to Christ. In ways we couldn't even imagine. They're coming to Christ through uh, dreams and visions in many places. Because the, the messengers can't get in. For your righteous acts have been revealed. Now, so after this, um, one other reference. I don't think, I didn't put that on the, that I wanted to refer to. Eight, Psalm 86. What's amazing, a lot of times we don't, we miss this. And I, I, did, I did it too for a long, long time. But, but the Psalms are really a, another way of pointing us continually to Jesus, to the Messiah. And there's, it's filled with a lot of this. But look at Psalm 86, verse 8, for example. Among the gods, well, there's none like you, Lord. There's one Yahweh. There's one true God. All the rest are false. And all the nations, verse 9, you have made will what? Come and worship before you, O oh Lord. What's he talking about there in the psalm? That reclaiming the people. They will bring glory to your name. That's what we just read here in Revelation. Well, John knew that, and he's getting that through the help of the Holy Spirit to show us. For you are great and do what? Marvelous deeds. For you alone are God. Wow. There it is again. All the way back here in the Old Testament. All right, so that's a great song of victory. They're standing there with a victorious message and song. And then John says, I looked in heaven, the temple that is, in, in heaven, the temple that is, the tabernacle of the testimony was opened. What's the importance of the, what was the importance of the tabernacle and the temple? In Old Testament times, what did the, what did the tabernacle and the temple do? What was its in, intended purpose? What, what did God want? When he brought them into that promised land, he wanted to dwell with them. And Revelation tells us, guess what? God is going to dwell with us. He's going to be our God, and we're going to be his people. That's what he's wanted all along. 
He chose them so he could have them to be his representatives. And the, the idea of the tabernacle and the temple was so that his presence would be among them. Where, where was his presence symbolically in the tabernacle and the temple? In the Holy of Holies. That his glory dwelt there. Mercy seat of the ark. The, the idea of the tabernacle and the temple was to bring heaven down to earth and earth to heaven with the ministry of the temple and all that went in there was to bring God to the people and the people to God. That's what a priestly ministry was to do. And that's what it's still supposed to do, although the temple is not a physical structure anymore, is it? Nope. It's us. He's now found a home in us, and we get to be his living, working ambassadors and messengers. Again, take you back to the message of the churches. What was the message there about there being the lampstand? Talked about witnessing. And so many times the threat was, if you won't repent and stay away from these false teachings, I'm going to remove your what? Your lampstand. That's the, that was the message in chapter 11 of the two witnesses. The two witnesses, symbolic of the church. We're to witness. The tabernacle of testimony was opened and out of the temple come the seven angels with the seven plagues. In other words, this is it's going to be complete now. He's going to this is a picture of how he's going to wrap everything up. They're dressed in clean, shining linen and wore gold sashes around their chests. What does that remind you of? The clothing, the whiteness, the linen, the sash. Who wore that? The priest. The priest. And especially the high priest, who could only go in there, as we know, once a year. But he had special clothing. He had to do all these special things in order to get in there. But this is talking about priestly function. Okay? They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore gold sashes on their chest. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven, seven golden bowls. Now they're, they're coming. Filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. No one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. I'd say, now here it all comes. And it's, it's coming down to an end. So, um, question up to that point. What were the bowls used in, sacrifice, in sacrifices in Israel? Blood. They held, in occasion, they held the blood, but more importantly, they collected the ashes of the burnt sacrifice, carried them out. <clears throat> That's kind of an interesting little connection there. Point of God's presence is filling the temple here. That's the imagery. And he's now saying it's time. It's time. We don't know when that time is. Jesus said that very clearly. If you go all the way back to the days of Noah and the threat of the coming rain, who shut the door of the ark? God, God did, not Noah. And they had a chance to repent? Well, yeah, they did. Noah's called a preacher of righteousness. And there was an opportunity there, if you look at the text, that he had a long time building the ark. So they had a chance, didn't they? When the rain finally came, I'm sure that they were mocking and laughing at him for a long time. I mean, after all, you're building this big old ark out in the desert. I mean, that'd be crazy, right? Until the rains came. And then judgment came, didn't it? Full force. Only God said, now it's not going to be that way anymore. It's going to be by what? Fire. Fire. Yep. So I heard a voice, 16, from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath. Where? Yeah. On the earth. <coughs> Final judgment. Before, in the, in the, in the uh, seals, in the trumpets, partial. Third, fourth. Now it's complete. He's recapping. This is the last one. This is the last series of seven that we're going to have. Saying basically the same thing. First angel went and poured out his bowl in the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. I gave you a handout earlier that compared the seven trumpets and the seven bowls 
to the 10 plates. And somewhere in your handouts, maybe you have that still, but that's an interesting little comparison. It shows you the connection that John is using, bringing the plague issue of, of Egypt back into the picture. And so now if you, if you uh, think about the plague here, what's this one remind you of? Ugly, painful sores. This, this goes back to, oh, let me bring it up. The bowl, the plague of boils in Egypt, that was the sixth plague. So that's one of them. Who did the plagues affect? The Egyptians. The Egyptians. Did they bother Israel? No. No? Not even any indication that they were bothered by the plague. So this is on those who are outside of God, who are opposed to God. So the first angel pours out the, the plague of these painful sores. This is for those who have the mark of the beast, whose life is devoted to the beast. They don't want anything to do with God. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it turned to blood. Well, that, we know that also goes back, doesn't it? To the plague of the blood turning, or the Nile turning to blood. And also kind of combines the death of the firstborn because it talks about death here. But it's on every living thing now. The trumpets and the seals were not that way. They were intended to show how God uses things like that to bring people to repentance, but most people won't. So the second angel pours his bowl on the sea, turned to blood like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea died. Okay, now we've got death entering the picture to all, not partial. The third angel poured out his bowl in the rivers and springs of water. Now we've got a similar thing here. And they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters. Oh, we got an angel in charge of something. Here's the waters. Earlier in Revelation, we had some in charge of the winds. One had in charge of the abyss. Okay, so they're doing some stuff, aren't they? You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One. What's missing? You are and you were, but... You're not, you're not to come because you're here. You're here. <laughs> you're here. Okay, so that's missing here for a purpose. Because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets. Who did? Well, all those who are under the rule of the beast, who are under Satan's rule, are they still doing that? You bet they are. They've been doing it for centuries. That's how he's worked, through government, through religion, to persecute, to kill God's people. They are still doing it, right? I mean, Islam is nothing but a nice, friendly, alternate religion belief, isn't it? No. They're very, very strong in their hate overall. I'm not saying every Muslim, but the teaching is teaching that of of, uh, destruction. They want to wipe out Christianity. So do the Hindus. They want to wipe out Christianity. You have given them blood to drink as they deserve. Now God's saying now judgment's going to come to them as it did to nations who persecuted Israel in the past. They didn't last all that long really, did they? Yes, the verse 7, yet, the word yes there is really the word amen, so be it. Lord God Almighty, again, is mentioned. The true and just are your judgments. Well, what does just the victory song say? The same thing. Great and marvelous are your deeds. Your righteous acts have been revealed. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. And they were seared by the intense heat. And they did what? Curse the name of God, who had control over these plagues, but they what? Didn't repent. Wouldn't repent. See, that's, that's the message that keeps coming back. They just wouldn't repent. But remember, Jesus told the believers in the churches the same thing. He said, you too need to repent. Right? Certain things there. And give Him glory. What's the idea of the sun? 
power of the sun. A lot of these, uh, a lot of these past uh, powers, earthly powers, and religious beliefs. What did they primarily worship? The sun. The sun. Pharaoh thought he was the incarnation of the sun god. Um, a lot of the cultures worship the sun. So, this is kind of the opposite of the plague of darkness, isn't it? But again, power over nature. God is revealing his judgment through these different means here, and that's what the different bowls are, are talking about. So the fifth angel, notice that the, the, don't miss the bigger picture here. The bigger picture is that God has given these people chances to repent and had opportunities, but they keep refusing it. All these things have come. They've stood firmly against God in their heart. They want what the beast has offered them. They think that's life. They think that's power. And they're running after the beast. That's the mark. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And the throne of the beast, the throne of evil, is always on the earth. And his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Now we've got the darkness again. And Egypt was plunged into darkness, weren't they? The ninth plague. They couldn't see anything. How about Israel? They had light. Light, darkness. John says in his gospel that the light came in the world, but men loved the darkness. They loved the darkness. Where does a lot of evil happen? In the darkness. Doesn't it? A lot of evil in the darkness. Men nod their tongues in agony, and again, what are they doing? Cursing God. The God of heaven because of their pain and their sores, but they refuse to repent. Don't you wonder sometimes what does it take for somebody to really repent? What does it take for them to see that they need God in their life? Scratch your head, don't you sometimes wonder what how can they be so hard? So hard hearted, but Pharaoh was pretty hard hearted. <laughs> All that's done in front of them and still no, nothing. And the sixth angel. We've got the plague of frogs now. Poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up. Prepare the way for the kings from the east. Ah, now that would mean something to the people in John's day because Rome was the power. But who did Rome fear most? in their heyday of that time period? The Parthian people. They were the barbaric people that lived up to the north. They were the ones who, I think I mentioned frogs. And frogs were always in ancient literature, especially pictures of demonic activity. That's how they were, that's how they were represented and treated throughout most of the literature like that. So this is the picture of evil spirits looking like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. It's just, it's just, it's a really grotesque picture, isn't it? I mean, a dragon and frogs coming out of there, evil, you know, performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for battle on the great day of God Almighty. They're gathering them together. How has Satan been working all the way through history? Well, he's raised up one power after another, hasn't he? Egypt, you've got Babylon, and then you've got Greece, and you've got what? The stuff in our day? Yeah, you got Germany, Japan, and the communism, and the Nazism, and now it's terrorism, and it just keeps raising. That's the idea of being wounded fatally, but raising back up. They just keep coming back up, don't they? Kind of like bad weeds. You pull one out and they just keep coming back. Isn't that awful? It's bad, bad news. That's the, that's the picture here. For the world. Now this is involving the whole world. This is an end thing. And gathering them for battle. So if you have the handout, you go through there and you see all the different references John is going back to to tie these things together. And then... 
Verse 15 says what? After all those six have been poured out, behold what? I come like a thief. Has that been said before? Yeah, I think so. Didn't Jesus say something about coming like a thief? He didn't say when. He just said, I'm going to come like a thief. It means it's you're not going to know. No one else. There's another beatitude. Blessed is he who what? Stays away. Keeps his clothes with him. What's that a picture of? Being ready. Your character, your life, staying faithful to him. That's what the... That's what white linen garments refers to in Revelation. Your character, your life, your deeds. What, who are you living for? How are you representing him? So the, the warning here is, you're blessed if you'll be alert. And Jesus said that several times. Stay alert and pray. Watch and pray. Keep your clothes so that you may not go naked and be exposed. That's the picture here, spiritually. And then they gathered the kings together to the place in Hebrew that's called Armageddon. My goodness, we've had tons of stuff about that, haven't we? Um, what do we do with that? What do we do with this? What does Armageddon literally mean? Some of you already know that. If you break it down, it means Mountain of Megiddo. But the problem there is a problem. What's the problem? There's no mountain in Megiddo. <laughs> so John is really not talking really about geography. He's talking about a, a deeper symbolic spiritual issue. It's about a, a battle, if you will, or a war that doesn't really happen. Now, there were lots and lots of battles fought in the valley of Megiddo. Megiddo is really geographically... Uh, according to geography of Valley. And there were a lot of battles fought there. And right near there is Mount Carmel, where guess what prophet stood against the prophets of Baal? Elijah on Mount Carmel. Remember, we remember that, right? That was a great conflict, spiritual conflict, where Elijah said, look, people, decide who your God is. Remember? Don't be hesitating, wavering, and sitting on the fence between Baal and, and Yahweh. It's either one or the other. And let's find out today who he is. And they went through that whole that whole text. So that did happen there. Um, so there were a lot of things that happened at, geographically at Megiddo, but it wasn't a mountain, it was a valley. So what's John talking about? Well, he's talking about a spiritual conflict or a war, if you want to call it that. But there's really no actual battle to take place. They gather for it. But what's going to happen is there's going to be judgment. And that's really hard for us to get in our heads because we have been so inundated with, with there's going to be a literal, physical battle at this geographical place called Amagin. But that destroys the whole imagery of what John is saying here. God is actually going to re execute judgment on them before there's anything, any kind of battle. They're marching to their, literally they're marching to their execution because they've still been unrepentant. What's it been saying all through the bowls? The, 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 the uh, bowls being poured out. They, they refused to what? Repent. They kept cursing God. They kept refusing the message of the gospel. They kept saying no, no, no to Christ and yes to the devil. So it's all being gathered together here. It's coming to a conclusion. Um... seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and out of the temple came a loud voice saying it's over, it's done uh, isn't that what Jesus said on the cross it's finished it's over, spiritual victory is won the devil didn't know what was happening we got him he thought he had me by putting me on the cross but that didn't do it and here the finale has come. 
the final judgment is here. And there came, oh, there's this imagery again in verse 18. What? Flashes of lightning? Peals of thunder? Severe earthquake? Earthquake in Scripture is always symbolic of judgment time. Nothing has ever occurred like this one. So tremendous was the quake. Now get in your head that this is not, again, a literal thing. It's a symbolic thing. It's a spiritual conflict that God is saying, I'm wrapping everything up. And the great city split into three parts. And the cities of the nations collapsing. This is everything's coming to a conclusion. And God remembered Babylon the great. And gave her the cup filled with the wine and the fury of his wrath. He's already mentioned that back earlier. We looked at that in detail. Chapter 14. Every island fled away. Okay, this is, this is it. I mean, you got, you got islands fleeing away. You got mountains can't be found. The sky's got hailstones. 100 pounds falling. That, that's pretty well it, it right? <laughs> you know, the hailstones, that was in Egypt too. And again, what are they doing? They're cursing God. Because the plague is so terrible. They, they just wouldn't repent. They wouldn't give up. So now they're going to face the full fury of God's wrath. Ah, why? Why such hard hearts? So what, what do you think about that picture up to that point? Should we be telling people what's coming? What should we do? How do we get the word out? That's the big picture, the big picture. Don't, we don't want to get caught up in the details, and I know there's you know, a lot of different things out there, but what, what, I would like, what I would like to do is tie Scripture to Scripture. That's what John was doing. He was using all these things from the Old Testament the prophets, especially Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, and showing how that tied into history. God had a plan. He had a way that He was going to bring salvation back. He was going to bring Eden back. He's going to bring our rebellious hearts back. And He, he started with Abraham. And he chose the nation. And all that picture is pictured through the Scriptures. And how Israel fought these nations that were filled with rebellious gods over them, and God fought against them too with Israel, but they kept wanting to run back to these other things. And eventually, of course, we get Jesus to come out of the scene to be the promised Messiah. And he's working out that purpose, and he's continuing now through the church. We're his ambassadors, we're his, we're his lampstand, we're his light. And that's the key. Are we going to be the light? Are we going to, are we going to share the message and keep people out of this judgment of hell so they will be saved for eternity? And that's, that's, that's the message. That's where we are. Um, look, listen to these words. We've got to quit. Look at these words in 2 Thessalonians. All this is evidence, this is in verse 5, second Thessalonians, all this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. They, they were suffering for it. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to, those, to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believe our testimony to you. Wow. Is that kind of summarize what John's been saying here. Paul wrote that in his letter to 2 Thessalonians. Kind of summarizes a lot of what we just said. To you who believe, to you who have been marked, spiritually marked, with the Spirit, you who need to stay loyal to Jesus, keep on keeping on. Keep the faith, because one day He's coming, and you want to reign with Him sharing all those promises. That's glorious. Okay? 
So 17 and 18 are going to be a summary of the destruction of Babylon. Babylon is going to be pictured as a harlot, a, a prostitute, because we're talking symbolically about spiritual conflict. Israel in the Old Testament was accused of playing the harlot, of running after other lovers, other religions, other beliefs. That's the imagery that's used there. Okay? we got to stop. songs and I'll make a few changes, you know, that's what they're doing. And then when I save it, it loses that whatever it, it doesn't work after it was saved. Now today I save and it worked out. I was ready to change it because we figured out what we were doing and I was ready to change it. But it worked. So probably now it won't. But we'll see. <laughs> it works after you change it. Yeah, midway that thing was mid. It collapsed timber. I had to pick it up off the ground there. So I don't know if it's something with the tripod or something. It looks, yeah, I don't know what happened. Or this thing slipped and it, it pushed. It was, I saw the cord move. Is that so, that maybe so that I what? didn't think anything about it, but I saw it go over here all of a sudden the cord moved. And then it fell. Uh, it looked like it's, it's still okay now. The weight of that took everything. It just took that leg off there or something. Yeah. Well, at least it's okay. Yeah, I'm surprised you made the ball. It's going to be great. Yeah. Hey, you doing too? Yeah, me too. Oh, we already had one. Yeah, that's right. Hopefully, you fix it. Yes, ma'am. Getting patients at the hospital. Really? I've got a. Well, it's not. Uh, 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 other types of medical issues that are coming. 960, only 60 were coming. Oh. Now, are they, they're saying that a lot of these codes are to be variant because people aren't getting vaccinated. So. Yeah. Okay, we've got other issues. Well, you can understand that, but well, there's so much, there's so much stuff we can talk about out there. You know. Well, a lot of it is, you know, because there's some misinformation. And then the thing they're doing to the kids, that's what really is trouble for the other areas where they want to force them to be masked up. Well, they've shown that the masks do no harm than anything if you're wearing a lot of them. We're way out of the pandemic. Like the least at risk of anybody. We got a strange dress. I don't know. 
It is. It's hard to know what the truth really is. Right? Uh, I'm generous enough to get so I'm, many. I'm glad, but... Yeah, but... 